I'm happy to welcome you all to the evening lecture by one of the international guest speakers of this conference. I have the honor and pleasure to introduce Melinda Mills. Melinda Mills is a NAFI professor of sociology in Oxford and head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Oxford. She received her BA and MA in sociology in Canada at the University of Alberta and holds a PhD in demography from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And since 2012, Melinda has been the editor-in-chief of the prestigious uh, International European Sociological Review. Previous professional stations of Melinda include the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, the Free University of Amsterdam, and the University of Bielefeld, which is where we met for the first time. Melinda's main areas of research uh, include fertility, partnerships, uh, partnerships, work family reconciliation, and work schedules. And her current research examines the role of genes and gene environment uh, interactions on reproductive behavior. She is principal investigator of the ERC-funded sociogenome project. And uh, there she examines whether or not there's a genetic component to reproductive outcomes such as age at first birth, uh, number of children, and infertility. I think we will hear an interesting, maybe partly even challenging um, talk from Melinda, because usually sociologists don't talk about genes. At the end of the presentation, there will be room for questions. So uh, the floor is open to everybody. But for the moment, for now, the floor is all yours, Melinda. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra. So um, I will try to keep it a bit shorter because I would like to have uh, some time for discussion. So I'll keep an eye on the time. So I've called this talk a socio-genomic approach to fertility. And I hope you'll see by the end of it uh, what exactly I'm talking about and what that means. So if you were coming to get mad at me or think that I was doing something that would be bad or detrimental to sociology, don't worry. <laughs> This is not about genetic determinism. I'm not coming here to argue that, uh, that genetics explains all human or social behavior. Not at all. I'm a sociologist, and I'm looking at biology and genetics and asking whether they play a role. And it might be that they do, and it might be that they don't. But I'll show you what I've looked at in the last few years, and you can come to your own conclusions. So what I often look at is called fertility or human reproduction, and I just wanted to be clear on what exactly it is that I, that I study. So at the moment, I'm looking a lot at the timing or the tempo of birth, specifically uh, the age at first birth and the number of children ever born. And the reason why it's interesting to study this topic is that in Europe and, and in Germany as well, um, you'll see that the mean age at first birth, uh, this graph shows the mean age at first birth uh, for women um, across uh, many different countries. The bottom line shows uh, 1970 and the top line shows uh, 2012. And what you should see here is that we have a very large increase in the time that women and also men have their first child. So it's around four to six years later. So women and men are having children, and particularly women, um, you know, at age 29 and 30, and that's exactly the time when they start to have some reproductive problems. So for that uh, reason, I thought it must be quite interesting to look at whether this shift in postponement um, can be related to any biological or genetic factors. So I worked on this a lot in uh, sociology and in demography for the last years. And I wrote a lot of reviews about why people postpone pregnancy. We looked at fertility. And actually, we rarely included any discussion of biology and genetics. So I was one of those people that was guilty of thinking that everything was socially determined as well. So, you know, in the reviews, we talked about the reasons for postponement, and these are still very important. So why are men and women having their children later? Well, uh, I don't have to, to tell uh, sociologists this, but it's things such as contraceptive technology, the ability to control your own fertility, norms and value changes. Um, with the fall of infant mortality, you no longer need uh, many children um, in order to take care of you in old age. We have the welfare state. And there's a desire for less children. But there's also role incompatibility. 
So this picture shows, I'm sure some of you have seen it, uh, that study work-life reconciliation, the Italian MP with her uh, child voting um, in the European Parliament. Um, you know, there's this role in compatibility, but also um, women are aware of the motherhood wage penalty. So uh, Miller, for example, showed that for every year that women postpone having a child, they get about a 10% increase in their wages. Also, there's been studies on educational tracks and fields and how those influence family formation. A study that I worked on with uh, Sandra and others uh, and Peter Blosfeld was on the impact of economic uncertainty and job market uh, precarity. Um, and as well, we've looked at work-life reconciliation. So these are all aspects that play an important role. Social networks have been shown to be important. Do you have support when you want to have children? And also, I've done a lot of work, as have many others, looking at gender equity in the household, but also societal gender equity, and the ability to um, have children. So, I looked at that for a lot of years, and I think a lot of us uh, have done that as well when we look at family formation. But then I started to realize I was doing sort of the same thing, but maybe adding one more variable, so I was looking at education level, and then I thought, okay, I'll look at educational field and see if that makes a difference, or I'll look at it in a different country, and I realized I was having some diminishing returns, and I wasn't explaining that much more. And particularly for fertility, so the timing of when we have children and the number of children we have, I found it quite striking, and um, you know, I started going to some conferences where, where people, uh, gynecologists were there, and they said, you, you don't look at any biology? What are you, what are you sociologists doing? Um, fertility must have a biological component, and you know, and you rather embarrassingly said, you know, no, a lot of our theories and you know, a lot of the things we do actually don't include biology or, or genetics at all. So I came in, um, just as many people, quite skeptical and thinking, okay, uh, you know, how are we gonna look at this topic? But as a sociologist, it's sort of a win-win situation. If you don't find anything, then you can say, well, sociology was right. <laughs> but if you do find something, then you can say, wait a minute, we should stop, maybe we're missing something. So what you will see if you start looking at the literature on fertility and, and reproduction is you'll have the genetic literature on one side and then you'll have the social environment or the social science literature so the economists the sociologists the demographers and then there's um quite a bit of uh, unexplained uh, uh variance if you look at, at everything that they're trying to explain but it's actually probably not just genetics uh, or biology, and it's definitely not just social factors or institutions or childcare or all of these things that we often study that impact when you have a child and how many children you have. It's probably an interaction between the two. So that's why I started to look at this socio-genomic uh, approach um, a few years ago. And then, once you start meeting with other interdisciplinary researchers, you realize that that everyone's interested in human reproduction um, across multiple disciplines, um, not just in sociology and demography, but obviously there's a huge field, particularly with um, later births, so postponement of age at first birth. There's a huge uh, uh, study in obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive medicine. But as well, biologists and evolutionary biologists have studied this for a long time. That's what they call, number of children ever born is what they call um, biological fitness. So we were studying um, the first two topics uh, very often. We were looking at social environment, and this is something that I th think a lot of us have done, and it's uh, still very important, as you'll see in a moment. So things like contraceptive laws, childcare, housing, all of those institutional factors that make it possible or constrain the ability to have a child at a certain time or have uh, more children. Um, the social psychologists, psychologists, but also some sociologists were looking at personality, has been shown to, to be important about desire for having children, and different uh, partner characteristics. So choice has played a very important role. And the biologists in the reproductive medicine have looked at the reproductive window. So how long? Has it, is it shortened? Is it, is it longer? And um, what are the infertility problems? But they've largely focused a lot on women. 
So, and I think if we look across many of these aspects, also for the social sciences, women has been the main um, focus of this research. Um, so what I found also important in this project was to look more at men as well. So I'm restraining myself. I usually walk around and, uh, and uh, point at things, but the film guys told me I have to stay here. Um, so uh, um, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, and, and what we're, we're developing in this project is, you know, so the, so the geneticists generally look at these direct effects. So, so um, and what we decided to do was to say, okay, well, could we find any genetic variants? Could we find any genes related to age at first birth or number of children ever born? And can we use these in our social science models and our statistical models? Um, you know, and we've already looked a lot at the social factors, but even more interesting for sociologists and social sciences is the interaction between the two that I'll talk to you about uh, in a moment. So it could be in a social, certain social environment, those genes or that genetic endowment doesn't matter at all. And that's the more interesting question. And sociologists have looked at this for quite some time in the 60s and 70s. So this is an article from the American Sociological Review in 1967. But it got a bad name at that period. And I think many of you will be aware of the, the weak literature, such as the bell curve or, or other topics that have related this to intelligence. There's also been some work um, in uh, population studies in the 1970s. So there was this sort of revival. But what they concluded, and these offers concluded, was that social scientists weren't really interested in looking at biology and genetics. Um, and part of the reason was is they just didn't have that interdisciplinary toolbox in order to do it. And as someone that's been working on this, it's a very different discipline and way of thinking. So that's why I can imagine people haven't done it. And then um, there were some studies um, at the end of the 90s, the beginning of 2000, where they adopted a twin model approach. And they tried to understand um, the work of Hans-Peter Kohler and others. And some of them looked at twin models. I'll show you the results of those in a minute. And others wrote uh, theoretical pieces about, OK, would this be possible that we have a biological or genetic basis of fertility? At the same time, molecular genetics was advancing and continues to advance very rapidly. I'm sure you've seen there was this human genome project in the 90s. And then the human genome was sequenced and everybody was happy. They even said absurd things like we found the secret of life. And then they realized a few years later that they hadn't. Um, and uh, sociologists would never say that, would we? We would never even dare. But, um, um, and then there was uh, developments into um, 2006 where it was possible to do genetic wide association searches to find and isolate exact genes to th uh, uh, in relation to diseases. And the first social science uh, genetic wide association search on, on educational attainment was published in Science in 2013. Now, a larger study uh, was published in Nature just a few months ago where they isolated 74 genetic loci that they say um, uh, have a predictive value similar to what I'm going to show you today um, for educational attainment. So all of this was happening, and it was moving very rapidly, and it continues to move very rapidly. In fact, uh, we've had to work with molecular geneticists throughout this project because the methods change uh, every few months, which is something that I certainly wasn't used to as a sociologist. You'd get something exciting like um, fixed effects models or something would come in, but it, it wouldn't be as revolutionary as this. So what people, and this is maybe what you're familiar with, people were looking at in the beginning was behavioral genetics. So they um, examined twins, monozygotic twins that are basically have 100% the same genetic makeup versus dizygotic twins. So these are fraternal, they would be like siblings that are, it's about 50% or 30 to 70% relatedness. And they would compare these two, and if the monozygotic, the identical twins, were the same, they would say, OK, this is, uh, uh, this, this is a genetic and a heritable trait, and it's got so much heritability, 20% or 30%. And it'll, these statistical models allowed them to partition out what was attributed to genes, shared family environment, and unshared environment, so things like what happens after you leave your family, like your uh, partner. Now, there's lots of criticisms we could make of these models, um, but uh, at the moment, I'm going to move on because we started there and we've moved on from these models as well. 
but um, okay, it's almost an eye test, but you can see um, this is a summary of all the studies of uh, uh, twin studies that have looked at the heritability of fertility. Um, it shows uh, it by country and by cohort and by uh, men and women, but I'll just summarize it because it's so small. Um, so what can we draw from all of these twin studies that have been done um, on fertility? Well, there's a large variation. It actually, they're saying that age at first birth and number of children ever born is maybe 20 to 50% heritable. That's a lot. Um, but wait a minute, it changes a lot by country and cohort. This is what the sociologist you know, says. Uh, <laughs> that seems to be strange. Um, and there's hardly any studies of men. So this is the thing if you come into this field that you start asking these sort of questions. Um, and a review uh, where we discussed this was in the Kolner Sidescrift, uh, where we look at the biodemography of fertility, and that's open access if, you, if you'd like to read it. So we realized um, what the twin studies do is they tell you what's the heritability. So you know that perhaps 25 to 50 percent of when you'll have your first child or how many children you have is genetic. That's what you would know um, in a certain population. But you don't know what genes they are, or you don't know what, what function they have in your body. So that's why we shifted then, and I started to look at molecular genetics. So behavioral genetics in twin studies is quite indirect. But molecular genetics, you actually pinpoint the genetic variants. So we're very, very much similar from person to person. We're almost like uh, books, you know. So um, all of us have the same chapters. Um, and the length of our book is about the same, but uh, for example, on my page 100, I might have a spelling mistake, and Sandra doesn't on her page 100, <laughs> um, which would probably be true. Um, and, uh, or for example, you might have uh, use a different word. So you kind of have to see our genomes like books. So they're very, very similar, but there's just little insertions and deletions and just little changes. And that, those are called SNPs, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms. And they change in terms of whether you have a C or a G um, or a T or an A. And this is what we look at um, in molecular genetics. And then we see if the genes that we isolate have a structure or function. And you might have heard some bad press, and arguably it's true, very bad press. So what did sociologists and psychologists and some demographers do in the beginning? They did a lot of candidate gene studies, and these are these um, hypotheses in advance where they focus on a, on a set of genes, generally the ones that were genotyped due to cost uh, issues in a certain data set. Um, and then they look at the people that have that gene, so that would be like a treatment, uh, a, a case control study, and the people that don't have those genetic variants. And then they make the assumption, okay, if you have that genetic variant and you have this disease or outcome, um, then, then um, that's the uh, genetic uh, influence. So there's been a lot of limitations of these studies. And this is the thing, there was an uh, issue of American Journal of Sociology on genes, so all of those papers are wrong. Um, and, uh, uh, well, some of them. Um, and they used the candidate gene study. And there was a lot of people doing this research. Um, I forgot you were filming. Um, there's a focus on, uh, so what they did is they focused on hypotheses and just the sets of SNPs or the single nucleotide polymorphisms that were available. They were very selective. They had a really poor track record. And uh, someone in psychiatry uh, looked at the uh, psych uh, studies in psychology and found that hardly any of them replicated. So they used one small sample of 250 people or 550 people in these candidate genes. And um, there was a, pi a publication bias for positive results and not null findings, as we know. Um, so, and due to the statistical power, these, these things couldn't be true. So this is how the genetics and social sciences uh, started then, um, through the 2000s. And the editor of Behavior Genetics, which is the journal in the field in 2012, I couldn't believe it when I read it. Uh, the quote is, behavior genetics literature has become confusing and it now seems likely that many of the published findings um, of the last decade are wrong or misleading and have not contributed to real advances in knowledge. 
could you imagine? Uh, I'm the editor of the European Sociological Review. If I if I publish that, <laughs> you know, I just uh, it's it's. It's, it's mind boggling. So, um, so these are, uh, you know, this is how the field, uh, the, I tried to show you the progression of how things have changed. So I think um, the, the, uh, it went a bit faster than what people could, uh, could, could handle with their modeling and their understanding of the processes. So don't do candidate gene studies. Oh, and this just shows you, this gets a little bit personal. This, I of course had myself genotyped. Um, and uh, it shows you that these results cannot always be um, uh, what you would anticipate. So one of the strong uh, diseases that came up for me was Tourette's syndrome. And I don't know if anyone knows uh, that disease. It's uh, uncontrollable cursing. Uh, Anyway, I did it for a while with my husband at home uh, as a joke. But, um, but uh, you know, it said I had moder moderately higher uh, uh, risk of that, but it was based on one study. So these commercial companies often give out these results. But you have to understand it's probabilistic and you have moderately higher heritability. So you really have to be careful for this. So maybe I do have it and I've controlled myself. You're all being very polite. but. Um, um, or I could have grown up in a social environment where my parents saw the behavior coming and, uh, and helped me. We don't know. Um, so we were thinking about this and we published a commentary in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science a few months ago in July where we tried to look at some of these recent genetic studies and tried to look at how they've uh, examined uh, different aspects. So I've taken you so far through the classic and twin design, and now I'm going to walk you through the Grimmel methods, I'll show you that in a minute, and then finally conclude with genetic profile scores. So this is Felix Tropp. There he is, yeah, you can see him. He got his PhD yesterday um, and, uh, in Cronian, and uh, so he can't be here today. But Felix has worked a lot on this project as well, and Felix is uh, from near Bomberg, and he studied in Bomberg. Um, so what we did in this study is we um, did a genome-wide uh, uh, um, uh, restricted maximum likelihood matrix, and what does that mean? Um, what you can do now with these new methods, instead of comparing monozygotic and dizygotic twins, you can look at everyone in this room, the entire population, and see your genetic relatedness. So we might be 70% um, uh, related to each other, or we might be 20% uh, related to each other. And you can compare people, and it allows you to move away from some of those restrictive assumptions. Um, of the twin studies of uh, uh, shared and equal shared environment and, and, and some of these aspects. So using those techniques, we wanted to see in a larger population what is the genetic relationship and what is the heritability, so you can produce then heritability estimates for what we're looking at. And we published it last year in PLOS One, and what we found was about it was a bit lower than what the twin studies had found, but we had about, we could explain about 15% of age at first birth and about 10% of number of children ever born would be explained by these genetic factors. So it's lower than the twin studies, but don't worry, I'm going to get even lower after this. So then with Nicola Barban, who's also working on the project, we decided, okay, well, there seems to be the twin studies say it, the whole genome methods say it. So let's try to find, are there any genes related to age at first birth and number of children ever born? So we embarked upon a genome-wide association study, which looking back on it now is a crazy thing to do for a sociologist, but uh, um, it's water under the bridge now. It took us four years, and I'm pleased to say that last week it was accepted in Nature Genetics, it's top molecular science journal, so, um, uh, so sociologists can take over other domains, it's good to know. Um, and uh, and uh, it should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So what you do is, I, I call it, and sociologists call it data mining, but the, the molecular geneticists always uh, correct me and they say it's hypothesis-free research. So uh, uh, it's, it's uh, funny, funny conversations we have. But, Basically, it's uh, going, uh, looking, just, just dummy coding, looking across the entire genome to see if it's related to your outcome of interest. So it's a massive, it's a simple models, but a massive amount of data and calculations. And this just gives you an idea. These are the 23 uh, chromosomes and the poor little X and Y chromosome on the side. 
And it just gives you an idea of how many genome-wide association studies have been done. Um, and there's been many um, for different categories. So they found genes for male pattern baldness, for uh, ability to drink copious amounts of coffee, I've got that one, um, and uh, many different diseases as well. So to remind you again, this is what we looked at, age at first birth and number of children ever born. So why would we do this? Well, as I said to you before, we wanted to see, would the, could you actually find genes? And we were sociologists, so we thought we would be open to the answer of no, <laughs> there are no genes. Um, but we thought it's quite important since people are postponing having children to age 29 or 30 to actually look at this because from talking with gynecologists and reproductive uh, medical specialists, it became quite clear that people's genetic uh, propensities could be triggered at an older age, and it could be that things that wouldn't have affected them having children at an earlier age, they were all of a sudden experiencing problems at a later age. So we would expect perhaps genetic and biological aspects to be more important with an older population having children. Well, there is very, there's low uh, fertility in many societies, and I've always argued it's institutional and work-life reconciliation, and there's a voluntary, uh, voluntary aspect to it, but could there be a biological component? Could some people just be trying, and, and it's involuntary, and they're unable to have children? Because what we've seen is infertility rates have gone up as well, too, so around 10 to 15 percent, this is what uh, some of the estimates are, um, of, of couples unable to have children. So it would suggest that by, uh, with these aging parents that there is some biological or genetic aspect. And as I said before, we know very little about men, so we wanted to look at them as well. And then what I realized, after talking with molecular geneticists and reproductive people in, 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 in medicine, is we're very, very good at measurement. Um, I knew we were good, but um, they were looking at things like social environment, saying, oh, the social environment doesn't matter. Um, we added uh, in socioeconomic status, and then you would say, well, how did you add in socioeconomic status? Oh, we made an index of education, occupation, income, uh, and whether they owned a house. And you thought to yourself, how, how did you make the index? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and what, you know, what are you doing? And, yeah, so, so, so this was very interesting, too, that we were, we were starting to realize that we had these expert uh, measurements of, uh, of social environment that could really do something and contribute as well. So I'm going to, for time, skip through this, but I can just tell you it's a lot of work. Um, so our sample size, this is what took four years, um, not running the analysis, but actually trying to get 63 different data sets to agree to participate in our study. Um, because to do these kind of studies, you do need to replicate it. We did the analyses in two separate centers. It's much different from the quote I showed you earlier about behavior genetics. Uh, behavior genetics. You have to replicate everything now in different populations to show that you're actually not producing nonsense. So these are really large samples, and I'm very excited that we had so many uh, samples um, for, for um, uh, men. And this is uh, data that we're, is something that we have genetic data for and our measurements of number of children ever born and age at first birth. And we got it from uh, scientific studies, but I was surprised to see the amount of commercial companies that have genetic data and our phenotypes and insurance companies. Um, so for the conspiracy theorists, there's something for you to work on. Um, we did a lot of additional methods. It's a 150-page supplementary note, and I will not drag you through that now. Um, but I will show you some of the results now, just to give you an idea of some of the things we found. So, yep, uh, we, we found <laughs> some uh, genetic loci. So we found 12 independent genetic loci that can be used in models, um, and I'll show you the predictive power of them, um, that are significantly associated with fertility. And then we worked with biologists um, and people from bioinformatics and people from epigenetic studies to see, well, is there any um, biological um, role that these genes play? So let me give you an example of, because people always wonder sort of what is the effect size of these. Um, so the one, if we just take one genetic uh, loci, the one that has the strongest predictive power, it would explain about, and remember we're looking at these uh, SNPs, these uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, it would explain about a 38-day 
um, uh, postponement of age at first birth. But if you happen to have two GG genotypes, I won't go into it in detail, it explains about two and a half months. So those are, that's the sort of magnitude that we're looking at. And the, just one uh, low side for number of children ever born explains about 0.04 of a child. So I don't know, maybe up to here. Um, but uh, 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 so it's hard to, to imagine these. But that's just one of the loci. But what you do, you don't, it's never one gene all, for any complex disease. Um, only Mendelian diseases would have one gene. But for anything like diabetes, obesity, any complex behavior would be a multitude or polygenic uh, uh, genes. So we uh, combine all of these genes together and uh, introduce a polygenic score. So it's a weighted average, sort of your genetic load or risk. And um, um, it can be used in different uh, uh, data and we'll definitely be giving it out and producing it for all of the different data sets that have genetic data. We'll be adding this in so you can include it as a variable. So what's the predictive power? It's very similar to the educational attainment um, a paper that was published in Nature a few uh, months ago. Um, so for your R squared, it will increase your R squared for age uh, at first birth by 0 0.09, or explains about just under 1% of age at first birth. And for number of children ever born, it's 0 0.02. So, or, you know, just much lower than 1% of uh, why we have uh, the number of children we do. So you're thinking, okay, she did it for four years, 63 data sets, 1%. <laughs> What's the low predictive power? Well, actually, this is very common in most genetic studies, that they've had the high heritability from the twin studies, and then they've done these whole genome methods, and then it gets around 10%. And then um, when they do the genome-wide association studies, it's around 1%, 3%. So it's called the missing heritability uh, problem. Um, so um, they don't seem to merge these different techniques. So it's an exciting time in genetics as well. It could be a genetic reason. Uh, some people are arguing it's equipment, and we've rerun it on where we have more dense genotyping, and we get up to about 10%. So it's definitely an equipment issue. Can you imagine? Um, and uh, sampling error could be correct. Um, and I'll show you some reasons why. Um, because um, we come in as sociologists, and these genome-wide association studies often treat populations as the same across different, both birth cohorts and across different countries. But we thought to ourselves, well, couldn't different genes be important for someone having a child in the 1950s as a par it, it, it comparison to someone um, having a child in the 1990s? Couldn't, couldn't different aspects play a role? So what we looked at is in another study, we examined the impact of genes, which is very low. But if we actually control for genes, the, the blue bar is genes uh, uh, including the country interaction effect, and um, the cohort interaction effect is the third bar. And if we look at the fourth bar, that's when you include genes, country, and uh, uh, birth cohort, you'll see that you get up to about 25% explanation. So it could be that uh, uh, these studies have ignored these kind of aspects and this variation between populations and cohorts. So what, what's really the relative importance of this in our, our genetic loci, these 12 loci that we found? Um, I started thinking about it because, um, you know, in Oxford they were making fun of me, oh, you worked on this for four years and it's a 1% uh, <laughs> explanation. Um, but then I started to think, well, what if I only entered one social science variable into a model? What would that <laughs> predictive power be? And of course, um, um, it's very logical to think everything's multivariate. We know this. So if we just do it quickly, we'll see. Um, this is just giving you an example of the predictive power of age at first birth. Um, you'll see that um, you know, even though we're just under 1%, year of birth is, explains about 2.2% in the model. Um, education explains a lot, 6.6%, and age at marriage is about 15%. But the total explanation that we have with all of our social science variables um, and the genetic scores is about 29%. So that puts it into perspective as well. So you have to think of things like interactions and, and more elaborate models. 
I won't go through this in detail, but I just wanted to let you know that half of the paper as well is working with biologists to try to find out, you know, do these genes do something bad? Are they related to causality in the body or the expression of proteins? Is there an epigenetic or a methylation effect? Um, do they have a causal function? And I'll just give you some highlights right now. So the most interesting thing, I think, that came out of this was, in general, it was a lot about men, our findings, which I've worked on a lot of fertility papers, and the findings weren't that uh, very often about men. But what it appeared to be, one of our top hits um, that we looked at at chromosome 3 was very much related to sperm function and methylation and expression of genes <coughs> known to play a role. So um, when we sent this to reproductive medical scientists, they were extremely excited because there's very few infertility treatments that deal um, with male infertility. So um, surprisingly enough, we can contribute that as well too. And it's just interesting to know that men have lower numbers of children or postpone, postponement of children. There seems to be a biological function there. And there's other ones related to um, ovaries and, and different hormones. But I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to go a bit quicker. And just quickly to um, go through a few things, we also compared our different traits um, to what was genetically found in many other traits related to personality, infertility, and human development. Because of time, I'm just going to go through just a few of them now. So this is comparing our genetic results with the genetic results of um, different uh, other genetic studies um, that looked at human development. And I think the main finding here would be that there's a real, that there's a very large overlap with what we found for age at first birth and human development in terms of age at monarche and age at menopause and for boys, voice breaking. So there seems to be um, some underlying developmental or hormonal or biological link to um, having a, a, when you have a first child. There's an extremely large overlap. That's the top here, the red is age at first birth, with the recent study published in Nature on educational attainment and years of education. I could talk about that for hours, but I, but I won't. Um, but there's a very large, and there's a very large overlap with smoking behavior as well, too. So if you uh, start smoking um, less, and you, or if you start smoking later and you start smoking less, or you've never smoked, you're more likely to have a later age at first birth. We've also looked at relationships with um, uh, schizophrenia and different personality traits and have definitely found that there's a U-shape um, between um, very young parents and very old parents. So there's overlap, for example, in this study on um, people that have old and young children and develop schizophrenia. Okay, so I'm just gonna conclude now because I wanna leave some time um, for discussion. So do we really care <laughs> about these results? Is it something that's interesting for us? Um, and I think that's something we should really stop and pause and look at. Um, we found some, some, something, but what will this do um, to the studies that we're looking at uh, on this topic? Well, we're going to introduce them. Every data set that has at least 250 cases, we can introduce our polygenic score for education or for um, uh, fertility, and you can include them in your models as control variables or instrumental variables. Perhaps we can look more at causality. And um, I think what's more interesting, as I discussed before, was gene-environment interaction. And that's where I think, for sociology, this is, uh, so we had to first make the genetic discovery, and then in order to do the interesting stuff. And that's looking at gene-environment interaction. So just let me give you a few examples. So there's different theoretical ways to think about gene-environment interaction. There's a triggering mechanism. So it could be um, that you might have this genetic endowment, but if you have your children by the age of 25 or 29, you never, that's never triggered that you might have this infertility problem. But, um, or sometimes stress uh, is also uh, listed as, uh, as, as a trigger as well too. So it could be that you have the genetic endowment, it's not triggered. It could, it could be also that it's compensated by social capital. 
So we found in studies that we've conducted, non-genetic studies, and this is with, with uh, Nicoletta Belbo, that social capital really increases the realization of your fertility uh, goals. So we examined people who had desires to have more children at wave one, and then we looked at a later wave. And we saw yellow is the high social capital. So those that had a network to help them have children actually were able to realize their fertility goals. So you could think about it in this way as well. Social control could play a role. Um, if you're religious and you have a genetic propensity to become addicted to heroin, um, you might not ever have that exposure. Or it could be enhanced, for example, if you're in a certain environment um, that could enhance and, and, uh, and trigger your genetic uh, um, architecture. So just to conclude, what are some of the broader implications? And I mean, we're still thinking these out. Well, I don't know, does it challenge existing theories? I've tried to think about the papers I've written. Have I just discounted myself? I'm, I'm, the jury's out still. Um, so do we have to rethink our micro-level theories and agency? So I've worked on a lot of papers where we use the theory of planned behavior. Well, if there is some sort of genetic or biological aspect, how do you deal with that in your theory? How do you deal with it with the rational choice theories? Um, or are genes just something that's constraining or enabling our behavior? So we looked at this globalization project and went from globalization to genes. Um, but uh, you know, we saw, we saw institutions of welfare states as filtering um, the impact on individuals. Can genes be seen in the same way? And it looks like um, also there's some, some, some gender and sex specific findings that are very interesting. Infertility studies have focused a lot on women. Um, but it looks like uh, men play a very strong role, at least biologically, what we can see. Um, we could introduce some new methods and findings. Um, and as I said before, we're the masters of measurement. Uh, that's very clear once I've started working with other disciplines. So I think we can go in and actually improve some of the genetic studies and the gene environment interaction studies by our excellent measures of socioeconomic status and other environmental factors. Um, because of time, I won't go into it, but are there policy and ethical issues uh, related to our findings? Um, you could have that discussion too. Um, should we just hunker down? I have some colleagues that, that just say you shouldn't be doing this. Let's just go, re go back to sociology. So, you know, we know this. Um, should, we just, should we just retreat? Um, and will it overturn our findings? Well, I think what I showed you, I don't think it's going to overturn anything. I think it will just complement existing findings and give us a, a different understanding. So I don't think it's that uh, revolutionary in that sense. So it's very complex. The findings are very small. Um, I think social science indicators still seem to have the largest predictive power for all of the things that I've been studying, we've been, we've been studying. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done to look at gene environment interaction. And I also think that once we include very well measured social environmental factors, not only into fertility, but into a lot of these studies, sociology can really come to the rescue for some of these very weak, weak genetic findings within the last few years. So thank you very much. I tried, I tried to end early, so in, in case anyone had any questions. Um. So thanks a lot, yeah. and the floor is open for discussions. There's a person with a microphone who can come to you. So you're impressed, obviously. The Great, yeah. show some more tables. <laughs> Um, 
which is of course also connected to education, social pleasure, or whatever you would like to add at this point. And um, I would like to ask you if you think that this will have a major influence in the future in the facility. Okay, that's a important question that you ask um, because it comes up quite a bit, can these results be used for genetic testing? Um, and there are different commercial sites where even dating sites where you can uh, match uh, with each other genetically. Um, and there are also medical tests if someone's been known to have a severe uh, uh, genetic disease within the family. So I hope that I showed you from my Tourette's example and from the example of the predictive power of what we're looking at that these results could absolutely not be used for genetic testing. So, so these results um, couldn't be used to, you know, if you, if you have a partner and you think, oh, you know, I want somebody that will have uh, six children and I want to make sure that this will work out, <laughs> you couldn't use these results because you would explain a very small amount of it. So, um, but there are concerns about, about some of this information and, and, and some of this data for genetic testing, but it's very strictly, strictly regulated, and the use of this data is strictly regulated, which is why it took us four years to get it together. I don't know if you're satisfied with that answer. Okay. <laughs> okay hi. Um, thank you, too, for this interesting talk. Uh, my name is Lasse Schneider, I'm with the Um and I mean, I definitely find, um, I think also the, the most promising and interesting thing here are probably the gene and viral interactions. But I was also wondering uh, what role gene by gene interactions mm. will play in the future. You were talking about the genome wide association studies. And, um, you know, do interactions play a role with them, like genetic networks? Um, or is that something that, that's not been looked at yet on this wide scale? And could it be that genetic effects then? would also be found to be higher than uh, they, they are being found now. Yeah, so um, definitely, um, so in part of the biological work that the biology team looked at, they did look at some gene by gene interaction. So there's definitely um, uh, something there, particularly in some of the locations that they found in relation to men's infertility. So our hope would be that people would uh, take up the baton, uh, you know, the, the experts in that area and look at it um, in more detail because, frankly, I just want to retreat back to sociology now. Um, this has been nice, but, uh, yeah, so, um, but that being said, there's one more thing that we wanted to do, and that's um, um, look in more detail at the X chromosome. So there's really sex-specific effects as well to be, to be uh, examined here. And you'll have many other things that there's probably mediated processes going on, uh, you know, that one gene is, is mediating another. And I, I think you're, you're definitely right, but I'm hoping that people will pick up these results. That's generally what they do and look at these gene gene uh, interactions. Um, hi, I'm Nicholas Struber of the University of Aachen. Um, I just want to ask you if uh, you have keep, are keeping in mind uh, the probable interference of uh, cryotechnics uh, in the future. I mean, it's going to become, become a bigger factor. Yeah. And it could probably cause big interferences in your studies. Yeah, so are you talking about uh, egg freezing? And uh, yes. yeah, okay, so there's companies like Google and Apple and it, uh, that are offering their female employees to freeze their eggs as a work life reconciliation. Uh, sorry, policy, I'm sorry I'm laughing. Um, but uh, it's really what they're allowing them to do. Um, and uh, I was looking at Sonia Drobnich, who's worked at Work Life Reconciliation. I'm sure you haven't looked at that policy <laughs> before. But so they, they were offering that. Now the problem is, is if you look at the assisted reproductive technology uh, literature, you'll see that when these uh, eggs are, are implanted, um, they have a lower success rate. Now we don't know yet after they've been stored for 10 or 20 years. We just don't know yet what will happen. But we do know that older mothers have much lower rates of successful pregnancies with uh, assisted reproductive technology. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what these eggs uh, will, will offer um, or if they've deteriorated uh, uh, as well. But uh, yeah, it's, the jury's out on that. I've, I've been at uh, different conferences where they've been debating it and arguing it. But I think for sociologists, it's very interesting for us to look at this at an ethical uh, point of view, and should this really be used as work-life reconciliation uh, measures, or can we think of other less drastic techniques? So, 
so vor allem keine Asper Cash und Plus und ganz laut bei der Frau. Um, will that in get it? Is it in your data or do you also have couple data? Because oh. it could be just she environment, but yeah. you at least Usually, you need another person to have a child. Yeah, yeah. Well, not not always, but yeah, you do. But uh, with AR, I was just thinking about ART. Um, but um, so yes, it's individual level data, and you've you know some of the other things that we're going to work on will be uh, couple data. But also, I'm really excited. We have intergenerational data of three generations, so you can actually see the genetic transmission of different genes from the father and the mother. Um, and see which ones they're passing on. Um, but couple, that, that was really something we were thinking about that would be very exciting to look at uh, as well too. There's only a few data sets that have that available and they know it and uh, it's hard to get access, but we're working with some commercial companies that do have that data. from the University of Aachen. And my question is, the identifying of triggers, which you mentioned mm -hmm. for behaviors, have you have, uh, I'm sorry, do you have any implications if you could use them to identify special psychological behaviors which are indeed triggered or used I don't know if the US Army has studies on that in right. many purposes. Yeah. And the linking is already been used, but do you know some applications which your new studies will add to that? So I think that's also, the oh so go ahead. Great. Um, I, I didn't catch your second part, but I got the first question. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so I think that's the exciting part now begins to see, you know, are these, are these genetic uh, endowments or factors important um, um, if you experience these different triggers. So with that U.S. Army data, Dalton Conley and others have used it, um, so they have these biomarker measures too. Um, so there are biomarker measures of cortisol, so stress, um, but they seem relatively um, unreliable. Um, But uh, there's definitely research into looking at biomarkers now. So that could be one, so measures of stress or measures of uh, different aspects. But because I'm a life course researcher in the core, I like to think of things in terms of life events. So what we'd like to look at is to look in long periods of unemployment or labor market precarity or um, divorce or sickness or illness of a parent or incarceration. You know, these sort of interesting sociological life course events we'd like to see if they have a triggering or a long-term impact. So unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Thanks a lot, Melinda, for being here, and thanks a lot for the discussion. Thank you.